It's all quiet in the underground bunker. Doors closed, locks bolted. But the great one isn't just resting on his laurels. He's making sure your weekend is even better by giving you his best. This is the best of Mark Levin. Now the Supreme Court decision, 9-0 to zero was the vote. But the vote conceals what really took place and should be very concerning to those, those of us who are constitutionalists. The 14th Amendment, Section 3, we've talked about ad infinitum. I was the first to really address this, to confront it. I said, this is what they're doing. This is what they want to do, is to take Trump off the ballot, claim insurrection, and all the rest. The five justices in the majority were 100% correct. They said, look, essentially, Congress determines... Congress determines if the federal constitutional's 14th Amendment is violated. I would have gone much further. President's not mentioned on the list of candidates, office holders. This amendment would never, ever had applied to a matter of federalism since indeed the Civil War had just been won, and they were not going to confer power on states to make a determination about insurrection and whether or not a president could be on the ballot. The president was specifically, specifically not placed in Section 3 of the 14th Amendment, period. Look, look as you might. You have people saying, well, Congress doesn't say Congress makes the only decision. Well, actually, Section 5 does but let's put that aside it's a federal case it's a federal matter I would even argue you know they say the the majority went too far no it didn't so what am I talking about here's the deal you have four justices who don't care about the Constitution the three radical leftists Sotomayor, Kagan, and Jackson. They said, just overturn Colorado and be done with it. Don't go any further. And they claim, in essence, to be federalists, which, of course, they're not. They're leftists. Now, do you want to know why they did that? They did that because they know that communist Marxists like Jamie Raskin, who's done it before in other electoral college counts that take place on January 6th, will object to the, the counting of the ballots for Trump and claim that he's an insurrectionist. Now, it likely wouldn't go anywhere. But nonetheless, that's his plan. And the three Democrat Radical justices are in on the plan. I don't mean they've talked to, to them. It's just obvious that they, they're trying to protect it so they can, in fact, pursue that. Barrett. Barrett is very worried about the media and politics. She actually is a very, very poor justice. And she says, hey, look. At least we got to nine. That's what the country needs to see, that we got to nine. I think the majority went too far. I can't agree with the, with the minority. But then again, I've become a rhino, a Washington insider, and that's how I think. She thinks she's new, the new Sandra Day O'Connor. But if you read the Constitution, the fact of the matter is, even the majority opinion seems to be somewhat of a compromise. This is a slam dunk case. Slam dunk. You can't have a person in Maine or a court in Colorado or a former traffic cop, excuse me, ticket judge in Illinois affecting a federal election like this. And even if you look at this situation as 
as a matter of insurrection. Donald Trump was not convicted of any insurrection. He wasn't charged with any insurrection, except in the Democrat House of Representatives and the Senate found President Trump not guilty. Nine to zero, that's a good day in that regard, but here's the problem. That same division, that same animosity, that same political partisanship, particularly by the three, is going to have a huge impact on the immunity decision. This was easy for John Roberts. It was easy for Kavanaugh. This was an easy one. It really was. It was low-hanging fruit, but even Barrett was incapable of handling it, and the three Democrats... Well, they want to protect the uh, the Biden administration, and they want to protect Raskin and their ilk. The majority said that's enough for shutting this crap down. But that division is there. That's what today showed me. That division is there. It's going to be there in the immunity case. It's going to be there in the potentially the obstruction case. People have raised the issue of using the Enron obstruction issue. And of course, it's going to be there should Donald Trump's lawyers, I hope they will, raise the issue of whether Jack Smith is constitutionally appointed or not. These are the big decisions. This was an easy one. And yet there was that division. There's way too much politics going on in this court by the leftists. Way too much. And their opinion reeks of politics. Their opinion reeks of anti-Trumpism. And Barrett's there, can't we all get along? She's the Rodney King of the court. And so this will potentially, I would even go further, likely have an impact on a couple of these justices that voted among the nine who were appointed by Republicans. That is, this was an easy one. A little complicated for Barrett because she's really playing a different role, and that's how she views it. They're all looking for legacy. They're all reading the media. But it is possible. I'm not making predictions. I'm just telling you what I see. Of course, I could be wrong. But what I see from here, as I'm not inside the court is that Roberts, potentially Kavanaugh, Barrett are going to be weak, particularly Roberts and Barrett when it comes to immunity and when it comes to some of these other issues. I just want you to be alerted to this because as I've said, maybe for 10 years now, we live in a post-constitutional America. We can no longer rely on the virtue and prudence of many judges and justices. Not all, but many. So while everybody's celebrating this 9 to 0, I see some writing on the wall that I don't like. That concerns me. The kind of approach that some of these justices are going to bring to the job. And just remember... Jackson skyrocketed to the Supreme Court. She'd been a district judge. She skyrocketed to the Supreme Court. Just remember Sotomayor, next to Harry Blackman, is one of the dumbest justices in American history. And Kagan, of course, is a Clinton hack. A Clinton hack who never served one day on any court And I don't even know if she ever litigated. A Harvard law professor. And the like. So this is my take. Some people have written in Nashville, this is a sloppy court decision. It's not a sloppy court decision. The court is broken into pieces right now. And the problem is, the leftists on the court have no compunction about what they're doing whatsoever. And I love it when you have these people in the media today. You know, you cannot distinguish between so-called news people and people at The View or 
so forth. And so forth. The media have so corrupted themselves and destroyed the entire profession that they see their job now is to do everything they can to destroy the credibility of the court. I'm telling you now what's going on in the court. You have this former federal judge, Michael Ludig, who's made a complete ass out of himself. Lawrence Tribe, who I don't think is even with it anymore, complete ass out of himself. And you have all these legal analysts who said, we have a shot at this and so forth. Buffoons. Absolute clowns. But it's worse than this. And I get credit where credit is due, and I've talked about this myself. These issues have come to the fore because of Jack Smith. These issues have come to the fore because of leftists who are litigating in state courts. These issues have come to the fore because of Democrat district attorneys and a Democrat attorney general in New York. The Supreme Court is busy because the Democrat Party is trying to litigate its way into the White House. Civilly, criminally, local, state, federal. That's what they're doing. They may succeed. I've told you now, I don't know how long, that the goal of Jack Smith and the others is to get a conviction on any count, just one count, so they can call Donald Trump a felon. Over and over again, they're trying to provide Joe Biden and the DNC and his campaign with commercials. Do you really want a felon as president and a felon and a jury found a felon and a felon? That's what they're doing. This is evil. These people are evil. They're mouthpieces in the media. They're evil. They don't care about the country. They're grifters. They're trying to create their own legacies. They're trying to demonstrate that they have influence. And they're all Democrats, every damn one of them. Do you know why the people in Gaza are without food? It's not because of the Israelis. If it wasn't for the Israelis, no food would be getting there. They build these areas where they're trying to get food to the Gazans. The Egyptians won't let them out. Hezbollah, excuse me, Hamas is stealing over 60% of all food and medicine that comes in. The International Red Cross is working with Hamas. The UN, so-called UNRWA, is working with Hamas. But you want to know the biggest reason why what's taking place in Gaza is taking place in Gaza? Because the overwhelming majority of the people in Gaza voted for Hamas. And according to two surveys, one done by an Arab organization, one done by a so-called Palestinian organization, almost 90% of the people in Gaza, as well as Judea and Samaria, the Palestinians, would vote for Hamas and support what Hamas did on October 7th. That's why what's happening to Gaza is happening. How many terrorist attacks was Israel supposed to withstand? Iran did this. Hamas did this. The Muslim Brotherhood did this. The Islamic Jihad did this. Their leaders are protected. They're living as billionaires in Qatar and in Turkey. So Israel is supposed to just take it, but they're not going to just take it. Kamala Harris comes out demanding a ceasefire because she is a political... I can't say that, can I, Mr. Benazir? She's a sleazeball. That's why. Just like the rest of them. The terrorist Palestinians did this to themselves. That is Hamas and the rest of the groups. And the people there who gave them sanction, who gave them cover, who gave them support, they did this too. You cannot build a subway system in essence that's bigger than the New York subway system, the Philadelphia subway system, and any other subway system combined without the help of the citizenry. And they got the help of the citizenry. 
These Hamas leaders were not knocked off by some opposition group, by freedom fighters, by peaceful Palestinians. It's almost unanimous, 90%, almost 90%. That's pretty damn... Well, it's as unanimous as you're going to get. And so now, the United States and Jordan are dropping food there. They're not dropping food in Syria, where perhaps half a million Syrians have been slaughtered. They're not dropping food, (coughs) excuse me, in any other part of the Middle East or the rest of the world. They're not dropping food for the Uyghurs, two and a half million Muslims who are in concentration camps in communist China. The world is full of genocidal maniacs. They make up a supermajority of the United Nations members. And they make up the anti-Israel, anti-Jew, and I might add anti-America crowd. And so that's what's taking place. And so these people go on TV, they make these statements, Biden and the rest. And they make it seem like Israel's not trying to feed these people. Israel's got to stop. Israel's this. And so there's this piece that I encourage you to read in PJ Media by Rabbi Michael Barclay. The greatest trick evil has ever done is convince the world that it is the victim. So now the perpetrators and their supporters and their voters, they're the victims. You haven't heard that Israel's economy has shrunk by 25%, have you? You haven't heard what's happened to IDF soldiers over the last week, have you? You haven't heard that there's... Well, what else can I say? The way for the Gazans to have lived in freedom and safety was to turn on the people they voted for rather than voting for them. Mark Levin. Making your weekend even better. This is the best of Mark Levin. You're going to hear the reporting. It's going to be nonstop. The bar is so low low for Nikki Haley that if she wins in Vermont or if she wins in Massachusetts or if she wins here or there, they're going to call it a fantastic victory. It's nothing. Nikki Haley is not going to be the nominee, not even by a long shot. Period. 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 So they've created the impression that Donald Trump will win every state. So if she wins a state or two, particularly these liberal Republican states in New England. Wow. But the Republican Party is not a liberal Republican Party. She's had to move left. She's had to depend on Democrats. She's had to get funding from Democrats. That's what she's had to do. So, but they're going to look for every opportunity to say it's close. Why? Because Gavin Newsom. And Jennifer Palmieri, Clinton, Hillary Clinton's former director of communications, and others have said it. She's helping Joe Biden. She's helping Joe Biden. Now, ladies and gentlemen, with all that this nation is facing, all that each of you are facing, our children, our grandchildren, when you look them in the eyes, when people come up to me, whether I'm at a craft show or at a diner, or filling up my car with gas, or wherever I am at the grocery store. What are we going to do? Who's going to win? Nikki Haley contributes nothing positive to the effort to take our country back and to defeat the American Marxists, the Islamists, and what the Democrat Party has become. And so the people who are endorsing her as politicians and all, These people are delusional, they are saboteurs, and they are certainly not conservatives. All these things they say about Trump, that he's a dictator, no he isn't, that he won't comply with the Constitution, when it's Joe Biden who won't comply with the Constitution, when it's Joe Biden who stiffed the Supreme Court on two rulings, he said, catch me if you can, and of course they can't. It's Joe Biden who won't follow the immigration laws with the borders wide open. It's Joe Biden who's lawless. It's Joe Biden who's shredding the Constitution. This ballot attack. He was all for it. 
as I'm trying to explain, this is what totalitarians do. They project their own conduct, their own policies, their own ideology on their opponents because they try to destroy them. So Joe Biden's now defending democracy, saved democracy. He has his election, he says, save democracy. Also shows you what a sick bastard the guy is. He saved democracy? Joe Biden saved democracy? Been on the public dole his entire life, either ours or communist China's? Saved democracy? Seriously? Now, for those of you who are wondering, since one of the first two states uh, where the elections, the polls have closed, the bigger one being Virginia than Vermont. In Virginia, we have a problem. The counties outside of Washington, D.C. are the tail that wagged the dog. They're the tail that wagged the rest of the state with a few exceptions. They're very heavily populated. Many of the people are relatively recent people who've moved in. Most of them work for the federal government or state government or some appendage, a contractor, something of that sort. Many of them also moved to Northern Virginia from Washington, D.C. and Maryland. So they bring their voting habits and their ideology with them while they're escaping Maryland. I call them locusts. They destroyed one state, now they destroy another. And so that is not your typical Republican who's voting in these counties. When I first moved to Loudoun County, what was it, over 20 years ago now, I was looking to move to an expert. It's not an expert anymore. They're building townhouses and condominiums and apartment buildings as fast as they're building Starbucks anywhere in the country. They're just popping up all over the place. Single-family homes, they're barely building those. It's either a dictate, as we've talked about, from the Department of Housing in Washington, D.C., or it's just what these counties do. And most of these developers are Republicans who are liberal, who favor big government, who oppose cultural conservatism, but they're not Marxists either, obviously. So the Republicans typically in name only. Because they need government. They need a lot of government, and they need your taxes. That's what's going on in Virginia. In a 30, 40-mile radius from Washington, D.C. So the Washington, D.C. mentality in many ways has become a cancer, a poison that has metastasized in what was a bright red state at one point. And, of course, there's the issue of immigration. Virginia has received an enormous number of immigrants. And not just under Biden. And that's because the capital is, is right next door. And that's what people, I'm, where are you going? I'm going to Washington. I'm going to New York. I'm going to L.A. That's pretty much what they say, even though, obviously, they go everywhere. So Virginia is not a red state. I would argue Virginia is not even a purple state anymore. It's a light blue state. And when I first came in the Reagan administration and lived in Virginia, I, in my wildest dreams, I never thought that would happen any more than I would have thought Georgia would become a purple or light blue state. The Democrats are marching through the country like crap through a goose. That's why your borders are open for among other reasons, but that's a primary reason to finish the job. Where now Ted Cruz really is facing possible defeat. Where California is a solidly blue state, the home of Ronald Reagan. Just a little bit of history for those who are younger than I am. In 1980, when Reagan won a massive landslide, the pundits were writing back then that The Republicans will win the presidency as far as the eye can see. Why? Because California was red. Texas was red. You had uh, Arizona was red. Nevada was red. New Mexico was red. Yeah, believe it or not. All these places were red. They're not red anymore. 
What's interesting now is there's a bit of a switch here. The reason Reagan won massive landslides was not only because Carter and Mondale were so awful. It's because Reagan not only tapped into the typical conservative core of the Republican Party. He tapped into blue-collar Democrat America. Not even establishment Republicans. Reagan faced the Bush family that opposed him. Reagan faced the Ford family that opposed him, the Rockefellers who opposed him, within his own party. They tried to stop him in 76, but in 1980 especially, they threw multiple candidates against him. They threw John Anderson, who was sort of the Nikki Haley of his day, became a third-party candidate, did pretty well. But even with three candidates winning, Reagan got over 50% of the popular vote. Now, the demographics have changed, and they've changed purposefully. That's the plan. That's the plan. They tell you that's the plan. Because they're racist. Oh, we're going to have more brown and black people than white people. No, we're Americans. Why don't you look at our blood? It's red. But that's not how they think, the Marxists, the civil rights Marxists. And so this is what's happened to the country. The demographic changes, the movement of people in failed blue states to red states who keep voting their blue state patterns. It's insane, but they do it. We also now have a media that is far more ideological and certainly out of the closet ideologically than ever before in American history. I wrote a whole book on it. And so just be careful that you don't get sucked into whatever the spin is. Donald Trump is going to be the Republican nominee no matter what happens tonight in any state, in any county, in any state, or any of the rest of it. He's going to be the nominee. And what Nikki Haley is doing is selfish. What she's doing is grifting. What she's doing is self-aggrandizement. Trying to position herself for only what she knows she's trying to position herself for. The I told you so crowd, like the Wall Street Journal, they sabotage Trump. They undermine Trump while they pretend that they're the real great thinkers. They're the real great strategists. They're the real people who really want to defeat Biden when, in fact, they're giving aid and comfort to Biden. Mark Levin. You're listening to the best of Mark Levin. Ladies and gentlemen, the Daily Mail is reporting that the Biden administration actually flew into the United States hundreds of thousands of immigrants. I guess they weren't immigrants until they flew them into the United States. And um, and they're standing behind their story, as crazy as it sounds, as nutty as it sounds. Here's what it says. It also revealed Biden's CBP is refusing to disclose airports where it is flying undocumented aliens from other countries into the United States. It comes amid a continued flow of migrants over the southern border. Customs and Border Patrol, CBP. Biden's expansion of the CBP-1 app allows migrants to apply for asylum in their country, be flown to the United States, and given two years to obtain legal status. This is revolution by illegal immigration, Mr. Producer. While Biden's going to be screaming about democracy, I just hope people who are voting for Nikki Haley, I especially hope people who are Democrats who do not believe in this stuff, that you understand the party has left you. It's the party of AOC. It's the party of Hakeem Jeffries. It's the party of the border to the sea crowd. It's the party of the professorial Marxists. That's what it is. It's not the party of blue collar America. It's not the party of common sense America. It is a radicalized party. This is a revolution by illegal immigration. That is exactly what this is. Joe Biden's administration has admitted transporting migrants on secret flights into the United States. 
And lawyers for its immigration agencies claim revealing the locations could create national security vulnerabilities. In other words, we got to keep America in the dark. How come Joe Biden didn't tell us this? Because he's a believer in democracy? How come Kamala Harris didn't tell us this? How come Nancy Pelosi and Schumer and Hakeem Jeffries didn't tell us this? Did they know about it? Sure they did. In Vermont, it's 2% in, folks. That's why I'm not going to... Trump has 61%. Haley has uh, 35% among the Republicans. Remember, every one of these is an open primary. Every single one of them. And in Virginia... I mean, 9% in, but wait until Northern Virginia comes in. Trump's at 65.3, Haley at 32.6. All right. While the record numbers of migrants were flowing over the southern border last year, the Biden White House was also directly transporting them into the country. This is so unbelievable. Just vote on the bipartisan legislation. I'll secure the border. While they're doing this behind our backs without the American people knowing. Is that how republicanism is supposed to work? Is that how, quote unquote, democracy is supposed to work, America? Use of a cell phone app has allowed for the near undetected arrival by air of 320,000 aliens with no legal rights to enter the United States. It comes after a controversy over a 2022 transport program in which the administration used your tax dollars to move migrants throughout the country on overnight flights. This is an invasion. It's an invasion paid for by you through the Biden administration. We have criminals coming. We have terrorists who are, who are coming. Some are caught. Drug cartels, drugs through the communist Chinese that are killing Americans. Slavery all up and down the southern border. And they're flying aliens, foreigners, into the United States. Giving them two years to claim legal status. This is an impeachable offense. I keep saying it over and over. This is an impeachable offense. Included in details of a Freedom of Information Act lawsuit first reported by Todd Bensman of the Center for Immigration Studies. And by the way, CIS is fantastic. The best. Found Biden's CBP approved the latest secretive flights that transported hundreds of thousands of illegal immigrants from foreign countries to at least 43 different American airports from January through December 2023. And this jerk has the gall to go out there and blame Trump and the Republicans. Hiding behind a phony bipartisan bill that had three Republicans supporting it. The program was part of Biden's expansion of the CBP-1 app, which kicked off at the start of last year. Who gives apps? Who gives out app information to people who want to come here illegally? A, A country that seeks to destroy itself. Migrants were able, under Biden's expansion, to apply for asylum using the app from their home countries. But the Center for Immigration Studies notes that the transportation of these migrants directly to the United States is one of the lesser known uses of the app. Aliens who cannot legally enter the United States use the Biden app. That's what it is. The Biden app for travel authorization and temporary humanitarian release from those airports. And under the parole release, migrants were able to remain in the U.S. for two years without obtaining legal status. Meanwhile, are eligible for work authorization. If you are a blue-collar Democrat, if you are a laborer, as we call folks, and you're voting for Biden, you're voting not only to destroy our country, but your own family and your own income. They're giving out work permits. Flying foreigners into the country giving them welfare benefits, giving them work permits, and then giving them legal status in two years. Mark Levin. The Great One makes your weekend even better. This is the best of Mark Levin. Slow Joe is going to be talking about 
democracy. That he saved democracy once already from MAGA, Trump and the extremists, from the January 6th insurrectionists. I can hear it now. I could write his speech. He saved us. And we must not, must not allow them to threaten us again. Autocrats. We must not allow them. MAGA, make America great again. Hitler. He won't say it, he'll imply it. They threatened our country once before, a revolution. They tried to prevent the peaceful transfer of power. You hear it, I hear it, we know it. No. Let's talk about this. There's a great piece today at Town Hall by the indefatigable Byron York. It's called Trump Lawfare Update. I said, this is interesting, and indeed it is. It says, former President Donald Trump's victory in the Supreme Court 14th Amendment case, together with delay and disorder in the criminal cases against him, has set off panic among Democrats who hope to use prosecutions and other legal maneuvers to keep Trump from winning a second term. I hope Supreme Court justices are listening. Not the Three Stooges, the others. Supreme Court ruling darkens critics' hopes for a judicial curb on Trump, read one headline in the Washington Post, because the media is in on it. It's a state-supporting, one-party media, like you see in other tyrannies and totalitarian regimes. That's what we have now. You might find it outrageous that people in positions of great power and responsibility in the midst of a campaign would use the judicial system, the justice system, to curb one of two major presidential candidates. You might find it outrageous that those people, a coalition of elected Democrats, Biden administration appointees, Democrat Party activists, and career lawfare specialists are in fact desperately pushing the system to work faster, to win verdicts by Election Day. But there it is. But there it is. It's now... Acceptable for Democrats to put the Republican nominee in prison or to get him off a ballot. If they could, they would. And this is the party that hates the Constitution, hates the founders, but tell you that they're upholding the Constitution. Marxists like Jamie Raskin, who's a coward. The anti-Trump coalition has launched six main attacks on Trump. Attack number one is the federal indictment brought by the Justice Department appointed special counsel Jack Smith, charging Trump with 40 felony counts in the classified documents case. Number two is the federal indictment also brought by Smith, charging Trump with four felonies in the 2020 election in January 6th case. Number three is the sprawling 13 felony count racketeering indictment based on the 2020 election brought against Trump and 18 co-defendants in Georgia, by the elected Democrat Fulton County DA, Fanny Willis. Attack number four is the 34 felony count indictment based on the payment. He calls it hush money. It's a non-disclosure agreement. In the 2016 election, brought by the elected Democratic Manhattan DA, Alvin Bragg. Number five is the effort launched by various activists around the country to remove Trump from presidential ballots by declaring him an insurrectionist under the terms of Section 3, 14th Amendment. And number six is the effort to bankrupt Trump by way of a lawsuit brought by the elected Democratic New York State Attorney General Letitia James. You know, when you just read that, (coughs) excuse me, when you just read that, it's horrendous. And of course, the media supports it every step of the way, but it's horrendous. Now, with their efforts in the news daily, it might be a good time to see where things stand. Go through them in a reverse order of importance. That is, starting with the cases least likely to hurt Trump this year, he writes. 14th Amendment removal campaign is over. Having all nine Supreme Court justices agree that no state can take Trump off the ballot is a decis- as decisive as it gets. Still, and keep an eye on this, you might see the 14th Amendment argument revived if Trump wins. And congressional Democrats look for a way to prevent him from taking office. Now, ladies and gentlemen, does it sound like they care about democracy? They only care about democracy if they win. When they lose, they don't believe in democracy. 
All right, let's keep at this. The Georgia case, what can be said about it? Right now, everyone is waiting for a judge to decide whether to remove Willis from the case on the basis of charges of misconduct raised by a number of defense lawyers. If Willis is removed, the entire case might collapse for one of another prosecutor to pursue it. The federal classified documents case was always going to be hard to do this year, given that it involves millions of documents, security clearances, and special handling of evidence. The judge in the case has entertained suggestions of starting the trial midsummer. It seems extremely unlikely, and a verdict before Election Day seems even more unlikely. The New York lawsuit, unlike the others, this has been a ringing success for the people seeking Trump's financial ruin, trying flimsy and blatantly unfair charges before a compliant judge. Under New York law, Trump did not have the right to a jury trial. James won a $454 million judgment against the former president. Even if he manages to reduce the award on appeal, Trump has been damaged, and James is having a ball touting him on social media. The federal 2020 election and the January 6th case, this is the showpiece case, the one so many anti-Trump forces have pinned their hopes on because they see it as the prime vehicle to hold Trump, quote-unquote, accountable. One of their favorite words for his efforts to challenge the 2020 Results. Hold them accountable. Trial was originally scheduled to begin this week, but has been delayed by Trump's claim that he should be immune from charges over the acts he took as president. Smith is scrambling to keep the case on track, but the Supreme Court will rule not only on the immunity issue, which Trump is expected to lose. Excuse me. He may lose it, and he may lose it for two reasons. The intimidation being applied by the media and the legal analysts saying that he doesn't have a chance to win. So a lot of these Justices are watching this and listening to this, and it becomes more and more difficult to do the right thing. But also on two of the four charges against Trump, that is the Enron obstruction charges, which are preposterous, which some argue simply do not apply to the case, and they don't, and they never should have. Congratulations to the phony partisan judges in Washington, D.C., Then we have the Manhattan case. Bragg was the first to file criminal charges against Trump. Safe to say he got little respect for it. Even Trump's adversaries admitted that the Bragg charges were weak. It's really a bunch of misdemeanors that Bragg conjured into felonies through a legally questionable maneuver. And by the way, all these efforts to use the law this way, to create first impressions, to drag in the Constitution, all these efforts defy and undermine advice that the legal system, the Justice Department, the bar in the past has given, which is you better be very, very careful when you take on a former president, when you take on a candidate for president, when you intervene in an election, which you're not supposed to do, and you can see every one of those barriers has been bulldozed. Every one of them. We don't even discuss it anymore. The other case, as bad as some of them are, Got more respect and attention, and Bragg stepped into the background, offering a delay, trying his case while the others went first, but now all those cases have encountered problems. And Bragg is steaming ahead to March 25 trial date, less than three weeks away, America. The reason for the Democratic panic is this. Some in the party think, sure, President Joe Biden is weak and his polls are terrible, but if he falters, there's always lawfare. How many times have I said this, Mr. Producer? They're counting on the perversion of the criminal justice system to win the election. How many times have I said this? Now, there's been a lot of movement with the big six cases. Five of them may not be resolved or resolved in Biden's favor before the election. So it could be that the entire hopes of the Democrat Party and all those who seek to bring down Trump before election rest with Bragg. Now, I will say this. You've got these incredibly unethical federal judges and New York state judges chunk in the key one and she knows what her what her obligation is she knows what her taskmaster in the case of Joe Biden and the Democrat Party require of her and she will dispense with motions very quickly and she will force this trial early and do everything humanly possible to do it and get a conviction that's what she'll do because she's not a judge She's a hack. 
like so many in D.C. are. The judge in the Bragg case is an Obama-Biden supporter. He's another one of these elected, low-level trial judges. And the idea that a district attorney in Manhattan can use federal law to create, to invent federal state offenses, which is what he's trying to do, which is what Smith tried to do against John Edwards, because they all, they all learn from this, this punk, this sleazeball Smith. The idea that Trump can get a fair trial there is really quite preposterous. If he does, it'll be a, a blessing from God. Seriously. And then, of course, the Washington, D.C. case where the population voted over 90% for Biden. They voted for Nikki Haley, another reprobate. I'll get to her later. Pretty incredible that a president of the United States is facing this. And on top of all that, I want to remind you. He already faced a criminal investigation with Mueller when he was president. They came up empty. Because all the information was planted by the Hillary Clinton campaign and the media. That was horrendous in and of itself. The Russia collusion prosecution. We already know that the FOIA court, excuse me, that the uh, FISA court was abused to try and take out Trump and his supporters? We already know that. We already know that these two impeachments against Trump were phony, fraudulent. One of them, the Senate took it up when he was a private citizen. We've never had that before. They charged him with insurrection, did the Democrats in the House, before they lost their majority, right before. Right before, and they set up the January 6th Stalinist Commission which has destroyed massive amounts of the information that it gathered, including interviews and videos, texts and emails. Talk about obstruction of justice. But the system is fixed, you see, because they can't commit obstruction of justice. They pass the laws that exclude them, protected, you see, by the speech and debate clause. They destroyed documents. They destroyed information. They destroyed videos. It doesn't matter. The federal judges in Washington, D.C. press ahead. We're throwing protesters, and I'm not talking about violent protesters, protesters in prison. With massive sentences. They, even a panel on the circuit court said, hold on, boys and girls. You're getting a little carried away. That doesn't even apply here. So pull it back. Oh, justice. It's blind. No, justice isn't blind. You have blind partisanship and blind rhinos. All throughout the judicial system now. That's what's going on. And that all has to be overcome in order to win this election. Mark Levin. We're giving you nothing but the best. The best of Mark Levin. Prayers away from what will be the most contemptible, divisive, dishonest, speech by any president in American history. Barely given in a coherent way. He'll work his way through. I'm sure they've pumped him up as something. And you'll see the clapping seals in the Democrat Party jumping up and down. Every syllable will be so historic. But it's going to be painful. Because you and I are not honest people. We're people of virtue. Joe Biden is the opposite. His party is the opposite. The Democrats in the House and the Senate are the opposite. And of course the media is beyond contempt. There have been important speeches in the past. People say this is the most important speech in Biden's career. Notice how they say that. It's the most important speech in Biden's career. It was about Biden. It's about his party. It's about their power. Not about America, although they'll try and wrap themselves in the American flag, which they so hate. But it got me to thinking about Abraham Lincoln's second inaugural address. Biden will drone on like Castro. He'll give a Castro-like speech. 
Abraham Lincoln's second inaugural address, as you well know, was 701 words. It took him less than seven minutes to give it. My dad did a beautiful book on this, Malice Toward None, with fantastic illustrations and explanations. And I was honored to write the foreword, and I want to read it to you. Because they're three years, excuse me, three hours away from something quite different. In November 1864, Abraham Lincoln won a resounding electoral victory over Democrat George McClellan, whom he had removed a few years earlier as Major General of the Union Army. Although McClellan was popular with the troops, Lincoln lost trust in him due to his indecisiveness and at times defiance. Lincoln's re-election initially in some doubt was improved significantly by a number of Union battlefield victories in the late summer of 1864, especially the Battle of Atlanta and the March to the Sea led by Major General William Tecumseh Sherman. On March 4th, 1865, At his second inauguration, and on a day that began with miserable weather and heavy rain, Lincoln gave what many, including Lincoln himself, consider his greatest speech. Yes, even more profound than the Gettysburg Address. It was a speech delivered as the Civil War seemed to be coming to a close with important victories in South and North Carolina as well as Virginia, among other places. Indeed, 36 days later, Confederate General Robert E. Lee would surrender at the Appomattox Courthouse on April 9, 1865. And tragically, 41 days after his second inauguration, Lincoln would be assassinated by John Wilkes Booth on April 14, 1865. Booth along with other conspirators, was among the onlookers in the crowd that inauguration day when Lincoln gave a speech. Also present and listening attentively to Lincoln's speech was Frederick Douglass. The former slave was a courageous and outspoken leader of the abolitionist movement. Douglass was originally skeptical of Lincoln's commitment to ending slavery. But after their meetings and Lincoln's issuance of the Emancipation Proclamation, On January 1, 1863, among other things, Douglas became an admirer. Douglas also attended the inaugural reception at the White House that evening, but was initially prevented from entering the East Room by the police. He pushed his way past them and was quickly noticed by Lincoln. As Douglas recounts, and I quote, Lincoln called out, Here comes my friend Douglas. Lincoln shook Douglas' hand and said, Douglas, I saw you in the crowd today listening to my inaugural address. There is no man's opinion that I value more than yours. What do you think of it? This is recounted by Douglas in his own memoir. Douglas replied, Mr. Lincoln, it was a sacred effort. And it was the last time Douglas would see Lincoln. And a sacred effort it was, on so many levels. Lincoln's second inaugural address is among the most impressive of all speeches delivered by history's great statesmen. Although a mere 701 words and 7 minutes in duration. Not much longer than the 271 word Gettysburg Address and the second shortest inaugural speech of any president bar George Washington's second inaugural speech, Lincoln could have claimed vindication or gloated about the Union and its triumph, as so many political demagogues would have. In fact, the speech is devoid of the kind of endless personal references to self familiar in the prose of modern presidents. Nor did Lincoln set forth a long list of specific tasks confronting the nation and attempt to rally the people in their discharge as many had expected. Instead, instead, as at Gettysburg, 
Lincoln delivered the ideal speech. A speech where every word was carefully chosen, every sentence carefully structured. It was a tour de force, not only in its precision, but more important for its message of tolerance, reconciliation. Its purpose was to address war-weary Americans, lay the foundation for peace. Lincoln knew well that every corner of the country had been impacted by the war. The casualties were unimaginable, with hundreds of thousands dead. Post-war reconstruction would be an incredibly difficult and complex task involving the restoration of the economy, rebuilding cities and towns, assimilating regions, promoting racial harmony, caring for the maimed and widows, legal and constitutional challenges, and so much more. Although Lincoln would not live to lead the reconstruction efforts, the spirit and direction of his intentions could not have been clearer. They were best exemplified by these magnificent and most memorable words. With malice toward none, with charity for all. During the course of the war, Lincoln was known to pray frequently, seeking strength from God and his hand and guidance. Some noted, including Douglas, that Lincoln's speech seemed fashioned after sermon. In fact, nearly half the speech invokes references to God or Scripture. Lincoln spoke of the woe due to those by whom the offense of slavery came. He observed that both Northerners and Southerners read the same Bible, pray to the same God, and each invokes his aid against the other. The prayers of both could not be answered. Lincoln proclaimed that American slavery was a blight that God, quote, knows no wills to remove, now wills to remove. And despite the toll on lives and treasure, the judgments of the Lord are true and righteous altogether. If there is ever any doubt that the Civil War was fought not only to maintain the Union, but in the end to drive the horror of slavery from the land, there was no more. It is reported by numerous reliable observers that when Lincoln began his second inaugural address, the stormy weather clouds of that day gave way to the light of a shining sun. Walt Whitman was one who wrote about it. At the time, he was a news reporter, and he watched it. It is an image that underscores Lincoln's exceptionality. He was not only an extraordinary president, but a remarkable man whose wisdom will continue to span generations. My father wrote that. I think I said I did, but that's ridiculous. My father wrote that. He was a great writer. Great writer. Now I want you to hear what Lincoln said. Again, second inauguration, not State of the Union, but the importance is the issue, the nature of the speech. The nation is watching. We'll see how close Joe Biden comes to Abraham Lincoln's standard. And trust me when I tell you, Lincoln, Lincoln could have been yelling, raising his voice, threats to democracy, could have been attacking the Democrats, the, con- the Confederacy. He wanted none of that. He said, at this second appearing to take the oath of the presidential office, there's less occasion for an extended address than there was at the first. He said, then in a statement somewhat in detail, of, of a course to be pursued seemed fitting and proper. Now, at the expiration of four years, during which public declarations have been constantly called forth, on every point and every phase of the great contest, which still absorbs the attention and engrosses the energies of the nation, little that is new could be presented. The progress of our arms, upon which all else chiefly depends is as well known to the public as to myself. And it is, I trust, reasonably satisfactory and encouraging to all. With high hope for the future, no prediction in regard to it is ventured. On the occasion corresponding to this four years ago, all thoughts were anxiously directed to an impending civil war. All dreaded it. All sought to avert it. While the inaugural address was being delivered from this place, 
devoted altogether to saving the Union without war. Insurgent agents were in the city seeking to destroy it without war, seeking to dissolve the Union and divide effects by negotiation. Both parties deprecated war, but one of them would make war rather than let the nation survive. The other would accept war rather than let it perish. And so the war came. One-eighth of the whole population were colored slaves, not distributed generally over the Union, but localized in the southern parts of it. These slaves constituted a peculiar and powerful interest. All knew that this interest was somehow the cause of the war. To strengthen, perpetuate, and extend this interest was the object for which the insurgents would rend the Union, even by war. While the government claimed no right to do more than to restrict the territorial enlargement of it, neither party expected for the war of this magnitude or the duration which it has already attained. Neither anticipated that the cause of the conflict might cease with or even before the conflict itself should cease. Each looked for an easier triumph and a result less fundamental and astounding. Both read the same Bible, pray to the same God, and each invokes his aid against the other. It may seem strange that any man should dare to ask a just God's assistance in wringing their bread from the sweat of other men's faces. But let us judge not, that we be not judged. (coughs) The prayers of both could not be answered. That of neither has been answered fully. The Almighty has his own purposes. And he quotes the Bible. Woe unto the world because of offenses, for it, it must needs be the offenses come. But woe to the man by whom the offense cometh. If we shall suppose that American slavery is one of those offenses which, in the providence of God, must needs come, but which, having continued through his appointment time, he now wills to remove, and that he gives to both North and South this terrible war as the woe due to those by whom the offense came, shall we discern therein any departure from those divine attributes which the believers in a living God always ascribe to him. Fondly do we hope, fervently do we pray, that this mighty scourge of war may speedily pass away. Yet if God wills that it continue unlike all the wealth, until all the wealth piled by the bondsmen, 250 years of unrequited toil shall be sunk, and until every drop of blood drawn with a lash shall be paid by another drawn with the sword, as was said 3,000 years ago, with malice towards none, with charity for all, with firmness in the right, as God gives us to see the right. Let us strive on to finish the work we are in, to bind up the nation's wounds, to care for him who shall have borne the battle and for his widow and his orphan, and to do all which may achieve the cherished a just and lasting peace among ourselves and with all nations. Joe Biden is incapable of a speech like that. 